Okay, hello everyone. My name is Stefan and I work for TypeSafe and I'm the tech lead for Slick, our database framework. Or to be more precise now, our reactive database framework for your reactive applications. You may have seen some other talks by me before and I talked a lot about what we do for constructing queries in Slick and how to map your schema from the database into your Scala code and all of that. So today I'm going to focus on something completely different, which is uh, the main feature of the upcoming release, Slick 3.0, and that's reactive Slick. So what is the problem we're actually trying to solve here? Oh, maybe I'll just give you a quick overview. So, so what we're doing here is we're giving you a completely new API for executing database actions. An action here is anything that previously took a session parameter, so anything that actually hits the database, like creating a schema or running a query or inserting some data. All of those are actions and you had the old API based on these invoker and executor classes and this will completely go away. And the new API is totally asynchronous for you. So you only get futures or reactive streams out of it, which makes it a perfect fit for your ACA or Play application. Because you don't have to worry about threading anymore and about blocking. Slick will do all of this for you. So what are we trying to achieve here? Well, the main goal is application performance. You can mostly do that now, but you have to know how to do it. And you have to know a lot about threading and blocking and execution, and you have to get all of it right. So Slick 3.0 will make this much simpler. So how do you achieve application performance? Well, it's quite easy. You keep the CPU busy, right? If you want your application to perform at its best, you have to utilize all the resources you got in your server. So that seems simple enough, but actually in practice it is not. Because if your application does 50% uh, of CPU intensive stuff, computations, and 50% database I.O., and you just mix those and run them on the same thread with blocking I.O., then you're only going to use your CPU by 50%. So what do you do? You just add more threads. And then it's down to 25% if you double the number of threads. Double again and you're only left with 12.5% that you're not using. So you can get uh, incrementally closer to 100% CPU utilization, but at the cost of adding a lot more threads and thus a lot more overhead. So it's not actually that easy. So the problem with threads is that context switching becomes expensive at least if you have very many threads. A few are okay, it's not that bad, but if you have lots of threads that want to run on a few CPU cores, you're adding a lot of overhead just for switching between these threads, which could be done in a cheaper way if you control this in your application. Also, there's a considerable memory overhead by, per thread because the threads carry a lot of context. They have their own stack and everything. So if you want to get into the thousands or even more, this, this becomes a, a real cost, and earlier JVMs didn't even support that. Also, if you use threads, you frequently communicate in blocking ways. That's the way you always did it with threads. You have locks and you have synchronized blocks, and these also add extra cost. First of all, they will block again, so you're not utilizing your CPU, and they also have a lot of overhead. So all in all, this means that threading just does not scale. But you probably already you, uh, know about this because you're writing Play and Akka applications, right? So you, we're not doing J2EE here where we have to block. So uh, we don't just have to keep the CPU busy, we do also want to avoid overhead. That means we need to be efficient. So what's the problem with I.O.? We're still using JDBC internally. That's the standard database API provided by Java, and every database vendor has a driver for that. The, there are options of using asynchronous drivers for a few of them, but they're all different, and it's a lot of work, and they might not be stable. So for now, JDBC is the gold standard here. And JDBC is blocking, and blocking ties up threads. So there's no winning here, right? Well, let's see how much of a problem this really is. So for that, we'll have to look at connection poles. 
Here's a simplified version of your typical web application. So you have a lot of clients there connecting to your application server. And then you have a connection pool that gives you connections to the database server. And you can see there's the same number of connections here on both sides. Connection pool just bridges those and prevents you from having to, uh, having to reacquire new connections all the time. So it makes this cheaper. But essentially, you still have single TCP sockets or whatever the JDBC layer provides for you. Now, if you do blocking I.O., that means your operations on these connections will block. So for every operation in progress against the database, for every connection, you have one blocked thread. So we're back to threads here. At least that is the ideal scenario. We'll see later that it's not actually that simple. So let's, let's do a quick quiz here. Let's assume you have a database server, which is the latest i7-based Xeon, or whatever you want, four cores and eight with hyper-threading. And we have two enterprise-grade 15,000 RPM SAS drives in a RAID 1 configuration. And you have an app server, which is powerful enough not to be a limit here. And you want to support 10,000 concurrent connections from clients. So how big should your threat, should your connection pool be? 10, 100, 1,000, or 10,000? Who thinks 10? Okay, that's about five or six. Who thinks 100? About the same number, 1,000. That's a bit more, and 10,000. That's also three or four people, so I think the, the consensus here, as far as we can call it, that seems to be 1,000. So uh, let's see what the Hikari CP authors suggest. And they took that information from Postgres, and these guys actually did the testing here. So the rule of thumb is you use the core count times two, so this is, these are actual CPU cores without hyperthreading, plus the effective spindle count. So we have four cores here, which gives us eight for the core count times two, and the effective spindle count for the disks is one. Because we're running two disks just in a mirrored configuration, that's one effective spindle. So the correct connection pool size is nine, which is rather low. But if you think about the intuition behind it, it kind of makes sense. You have eight CPU cores, and you can wait for one operation going on on the disk. So how many things do you want the server to do at once? You can only do about nine things at once. Everything else will just be waiting, either for CPU resources or for the disk. And if it's waiting, you can decide to have it wait on the database server or on your application server. And usually it's more effective to do that on the application server. So we only have very few connections here. We'll, we'll run with our nine or 10 connections now. And let's see what this means for the threading models. So um, we have our blocking web server. And this, as you probably know, does not scale. That's why you use something like Play. But the database server can actually scale. That's because there's a crucial difference between these two. If you have a web server, you have clients connecting to that server. They connect at their own time. And if you have web sockets for pushing data back to them, you might have a lot of active connections. So in our case, we assume we have 10,000 active client connections, all running web sockets and waiting for data to be delivered. And they're ready to receive the data at any time, as soon as you can feed it to them. But against the database server, you only have a single machine. So you only need to open as many connections as you need to saturate that single machine. In this case, 10 connections. So this is why you don't really need non-blocking I.O. as badly for the database as you need it for your web application. But if we go back to a traditional model of writing web applications, we don't even get that far. So if you look at something like JEE, it is fully synchronous. It's based on blocking I.O. So you get one thread per web request. And at this point, you can basically stop reading. You're not going to 
uh, handle 10,000 connections in parallel with this because you'd have to create 10,000 threads for them. But uh, let's, let's continue with the slide. So um, what you get here is contention for connections. You have different web requests coming in and they all contend for a JDBC connection object. They call get connection on your connection pool and your pool size is very small. You only have 10 connections in there. So if you have 10,000 requests, 9,990 will be blocked on get connection, just wasting those threads. And it's even worse than that because if the load increases and your database cannot keep up anymore, what happens? Well, the requests are answered slower, which means there are more active requests, so there are even more blocked threads that you need to keep in memory. So the situation just gets worse, which means that this approach does not scale, at least at, at this size. So what we do instead is we use Play as our web server or application server. And Play is completely non-blocking and gives you non-blocking I.O. for the web server. So now you have a non-blocking web server, but you still have blocking database I.O. So what you do in the naive approach is that you wrap your database calls in future of blocking of whatever call. And if you go to the documentation of these features, it would tell you that blocking instructs the execution context to add more threads on demand to your thread pool. So there's a global thread pool that you use in your play application, which is tuned for the correct size for your application server, for actually doing computationally intensive stuff. But if you want to make a blocking call that does not use your CPU, you put it into a blocking block, and this will allocate extra threads. So that, that looks like an improvement at first glance, but it doesn't really help that much, actually, because you're still contending for connections. So what happens when your application is too slow? Well, you create extra threads that get stuck in the blocking call on get connection. So you have exactly the same situation as before. You could instruct the execution context to limit the size so you don't, can't create extra blocking connections at some very high, uh, as a very high number. So you might limit it to 1,000 extra threads or something. But this is not possible in the configuration syntax. You'd actually have to write code for that, to write your own execution context. And even if you did that, you'd have another, another problem, because you treat all I.O. the same. If you have two different databases, then saturating one of them would prevent I.O. From the, on the other database from running, because there's no threat left in your pool. So this is not the ideal solution either. So what can we do instead? Well, let's move on to the Play Slick plugin. That's what you'd currently use for Slick with Play. And this plugin gives you a special execution context per database. So there's a thread pool, a connection pool size that you configure in your database config in Play. And it uses the same number for the thread pool. So you get as many threads as you have connections. So that essentially means that there is no more contention for connections. Every get connection call is guaranteed to succeed immediately and not block because you only have 10 threads that are contending for these connections and you give them 10 connections, so that's fine. So what are the remaining problems here? Well, first of all, the old API in Slick was not built for this model. As I told you earlier, you need to separate I.O. and CPU bound operations cleanly if you really want to max out your CPU and use all those resources so that you don't just mix everything on the same threads. But currently you cannot do this. Take an operation like this insert here. So you have a table and filter some stuff out. So this gives you a query and you insert the data produced by this query into another table. This is a single call to the insert method, but what actually happens under the hood is that first, it has, Slick has to compile a SQL statement for this, and then it executes this statement. So there's computational intensive stuff and I.O. happening in the same method call. You have no clean separation. Also, we haven't looked at streaming so far. 
just materializing a result completely, like getting a seek of whatever out of the database, is one thing, but streaming efficiently is yet another. Slick only gives you an iterator, but that's again a blocking thing. It's blocking synchronous AO. If you want to do, to do something asynchronous, you need push-based streaming. And then you're, you have to wrap all the individual elements in futures and create lots of extra future and promise objects and uh, complete them, or you have to wrap everything inside a blocking block and dispatch it to another thread, which means you need yet more threads. So there's, there's no really simple solution on top of the existing API to do this. But I think the main problem is the current with session interface. This is how you do a database call in the old slick versions. You have a database object and you call with session and it gives you a session object and then you can do something with this session that hits the database. But if you do something like this, call a future and then use your session in there, it will break because the session lifetime is delimited by this with session block. As soon as you exit this block, the session is not usable anymore, it's closed. But your future will do something at a later point in time. It just starts running now and will still need the session later. And the problem here is that you have explicit mutable state. You have a session which is usable at one point in time, but then when you advance your program, you have the same session object, but it's not usable anymore. It's in a different state. So there were some smart people before who already solved this problem, and that's pure functional I.O. So in order to solve this for Slick, we looked at the existing solution in pure functional languages. Now there are three standard approaches, so to say, for doing I.O. in pure functional languages where you do not allow any mutation. One is uh, using linear types. Unfortunately, Scala doesn't have those. The second one, which is employed by the clean programming language, is using, um, is using an, no, that's actually linear types. Another one is, another option is using an effect system, which Scala does not have either, but may eventually get in the future. So we reached for the most common solution, which is used by Haskell. So let's reach for, let's say, functional programming for 200. Who can answer this? <laughs> what is a monad, exactly? So what is a monad? I, this ta the talk here is classified as a beginner talk, so I don't want to give a monad tutorial. And just so that you can't blame me for telling you wrong stuff about monads, I just copied this description here from Wikipedia, so you can blame, blame them instead. So Wikipedia says, in functional programming, a monad is a structure that represents computations defined as a sequence of steps. And later on it says, as such, monads have been described as programmable semicolons. That sounds good. I've been a Java programmer since 1995 or 96, so I'm very comfortable with semicolons. So many monad tutorials will first show you something like collections an option monad, or a set monad, or a sequence monad. However, these can be kind of misleading because they make you think that monads have something to do with collections. But collections are only a special case, so we're not going to go into them at all. We'll start right away with the state monad because that's useful for what we're doing here. So we have a for comprehension. That's how you write monadic code in Scala. And we start by getting the state, this type annotation is just to tell it that we're dealing with int here the first time. We don't need it down here anymore. So we get the state value, which is an int, assign it to variable i. Then we set the state to i plus 3. We get it back out and assign it to j. We set the state to j minus 2. We get it back out and we return it. So then we run this with a starting value of 41. We run our state transformation and we get 42. Now compare it to this. This is imperative code. That's how you do imperative programming, for example, in Haskell, which is also called the finest imperative programming language, even though it's purely functional. That's because you can use monads for this purpose. 
you get code that looks imperative but actually is purely functional. The syntax in Scala is not as nice. You always need these underscore and assignments here because set just returns unit. If you set, you don't return anything. And we just ignore this here. But it's still the same thing. And what the actual monad here does is implement the semicolon. That's what holds these individual statements together. That's the part that's done in the monad. So, okay, you got your shiny new toy, the state monad. So, let's look how that's implemented. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you need for a monad is a type, or rather a type constructor. A monad is always an M of something. In this case, this something is the R type here. We have a state of S and R. S represents the state. In our case, this was int, and R is the return value, the return type of our transformation, which was also int for our example. And you can already maybe guess how this monad works, because state of S and R is a function from S to a tuple of S and R. So when you run a state transformation, you give it the old state, and it returns the transformed state and the return value. This is just a simple function that you run here. What you also need for the monad is a way to get a primitive value into the monad. That's the apply method. So apply takes a value of the return type and um, constructs a new state, which when you run it, just returns this value. The state is just passed through, so we get the state here, we pass it through, and we return the value. That's what apply does. Then we have our get and set methods. Well, get passes the state through, but also returns it as the return value. And for set, you give it a new value v to set the state. It takes the old state, ignores it here, so it's discarded. Instead, it sets the state to the value v, and then it returns unit. So that, that's basically it. Now in order to make this a monad, it also needs to obey some laws, which I will omit here because it's not a monad tutorial after all. But these are the main operations, except for one which we'll get to in a moment. We also need to be able to run this state transformation, but that just means running the function. And then in the end, we only take the return value and discard the state. We don't care about that in the end. So the one thing you still need, that's a semicolon, the programmable one. And in Scala it's called flat map. That's what you have to implement so that you can use a fork comprehension for sequencing. So what does flat map do? Flat map takes a function from our own state return value to compute a new state transformation. And we run it by taking our old state, first running the original state, so self in this case. That's the one that we're calling it on. So first you run self, which gives you a modified state S2 and a return value. Then you pass that return value to the function, which gives you the, the second state transformation to run. And then you apply this to S2. So the state gets propagated through these two function calls. And this is how the state monad works. There's also the map method, but since we have the monad laws and this obeys the monad laws, it's just a standard implementation. When you have flat map and apply, you can always write it in exactly this way because it's guaranteed to be the same thing. So, okay, we have the state monad which allows us to describe a state transformation. But we've seen that it's actually purely functional. We're just chaining functions here, right? We haven't gained anything. So how does that help us with mutable external state and with database I.O.? Well, there's a very similar monad, which is the I.O. monad. And you can see the code here looks exactly the same as for state. I still have the same kind of operations, except they're now in the I.O. monad. So um, the difference is that we run this I.O. monad on some mutable state. In this case, I've just used a class DB which contains a var. So this is our database in this case. 
it's, it's not really a database, but it is a var. It's actual mutable state. We never create a new instance of DB when we run this. We mutate this variable inside. So we have mutable state that's hidden in there. And when, you, when we run this, you can see we just apply it to the DB object, as we did before with the state. And the result is as expected. So how is this implemented? Well, the function looks a bit different. Excuse me. You can see that uh, the state type is gone, first of all, because we're operating on this DB type now. It's fixed, so to say. But more importantly, the transformation is now from the DB type to the return type, not to a tuple of DB and the return type. So we're not just passing some immutable value through this computation. Instead, what we do in this function is that as a side effect of running it, we mutate the state. We're allowed to do this in here. You can see this, for example, in the set method. If you want to set a new value, instead of just replacing the old state, we set db.i to the new value. That's the side effect we're doing here, the side effect that's hidden inside this I.O. But if you go back here, the transformation is still purely functional, right? This thing is pure. There's absolutely no side effect happening when you describe this transformation. It's only a description. The only actual mutation happens when you run it down here. That's where the bad part is isolated, so to say. So here's the flat map and the map implementation now. Flat map still does the same thing as before, except it doesn't have to thread the state through anymore. That happens automatically because you're just mutating. But you're still executing both of the functions in the same order. First we have self.apply and we pass the state to it, the database. Then we wrap that in F so we get the new I.O. action. And we pass that mutated state to this new I.O. action. So we're still doing them in the correct order. And the way this flat map method is written, the way the signature looks, we don't really have a choice of doing anything else. It's almost correct by construction. So one problem that still remains here is that we actually have a function that, is, that has a side effect when you run it. So that, that's not really nice because you could write your own functions and you st if you imagine this is the session, you would still see the session and could do something with it. That's what we want to avoid. So what can we do here? Well, we hide it. We could just give you an abstract trait, IO of R. It doesn't extend a function anymore. Instead, we use a free monad pattern. So we reify the computation. Instead of just constructing a new IO here, we have a specific type flat map IO. There's one type for each operation we have to encode, and it just encodes whatever we pass to it. Actually, there's an error here. This should be, there should be an F here. We need to pass F to this flat map I.O. You can see it here. Flat map I.O. has the same, same signature as this flat map method. We just encode the information in there. So we end up with an AST that describes, a tree that describes what to do, how to run this I.O. And then in the actual run method, we have an interpreter. So we match on the I.O. And in this case, if it's a flat map I.O., then we run this. So we can separate construction of this I.O. from the implementation. This, for one thing, it means that you don't see the session type anymore. It's now perfectly well hidden. But we also have the option of having multiple interpreters for this. And we need those because we want to support both immediate execution, where you materialize the whole result, and streaming, where you get a reactive streams publisher for your results. These require slightly different interpreters, but we can use the same structure and run the interpreter for both. So if you look at, <coughs> at asynchronous programming, you already have another monad, and that's the future monad. So you're probably already used to using monadic style for programming with the future monad. And the nice thing about futures is that they abstract over blocking. If you take this call f1.flatmap, just discard the value and return f2, 
You don't know if F1 blocks or runs synchronously or already has the value or does something asynchronous. It doesn't matter. You always write the same flat map call and the execution engine will figure out the right thing to do. But one thing we cannot do with futures, they are not sequential. Futures support asynchronous execution. Like in this case, F2, if we actually run an operation here that gives us a future, that may be sequential, but F2 could already be running. We could have started this up here and gotten a future F2, which is already done. Only the results are used sequentially, but the operations can run asynchronously. So that's not the right thing for database I.O. So what we do is we have a run method on our database, just as in the toy example before, which takes a DBIO action. This is now the actual type we use in Slick. You can see the return type is R, and there's the interpreter hidden in there in the actual implementation, and what you get out of it <coughs> is not an R, because we'd have to block, it's a future of R. So uh, the goal there is for your application, as long as you need to do something sequentially on the database or use transactions or error handling on the database, you need to lift your code not into future but one step higher into DBIO. So DBIO is a database action that you can run at some point but which is not yet running. It's just a description of what to do. And then at some point when you have composed all these operations in DBIO, you can actually run them and get a future out of it. And then if you want, you can compose these futures asynchronously. So let's look at some actual composition here. If you've used Slick before, you will recognize this code to the right of the arrows. That's the same as before. We have two schemas, we concatenate them, and we call dot .create. Previously, this method took a session and immediately ran the code. Now it returns a database I.O. action. The same for inserting with plus plus equal. We insert a sequence of several rows, and this returns a database I.O. action. So now we can compose them sequentially using the flat map method in the for comprehension. And eventually, we just return unit because we don't care about the return type here. So there's a simpler way to write this. And that's using the end then operator, which is also available as a symbolic operator with the double right angle bracket which you may recognize from Haskell, because it's exactly the same thing there for monads. This code is slightly different because it produce, actually returns the result of the right-hand side, so this would return, it should return three. We're inserting three values here. It discards the left-hand side result, returns the right-hand side result. But since we don't care about the result, this is okay for now. And there's an even simpler version if you don't care about the results. There's dbio.seek which takes var arcs, so you can just sequence as many operations as you want there, as long as you don't care about the return value. So, as far as functionality is concerned, these are the same. You can use them for exactly the same purpose. There is one difference, however. If you look at flat map, it takes an execution context. That's what you need to run some asynchronous code. This could be a thread pool. That's what it usually is. On the other hand, the end then method does not need an execution context. The difference is that flat map takes a function. You give it a function that you write here. In this case, you don't actually see that it's a function. You, know? you just have a bit of code. But when you execute this, it will not construct these actions for inserting until it has done the stuff above it because it needs the value, even though you don't use it, it needs to compute this value first, and then it can compute the next action. On the other hand, if you look at A2 and A3, all the actions are computed up front before you run anything. And in order to protect you from running something on the wrong execution context, Slick separates these things very cleanly. So, any method that takes a function that you write also takes an execution context. And this is the execution context which is provided by Play or Akka if you're writing a Play or Akka application. They give you a default execution context that you can use for computationally intensive stuff.
and all the actual database work is run on an execution context provided by Slick, which is not available to you. This is done internally. So the only thing that will ever run on this execution context is blocking database calls. Another benefit of using combinators like and then, which do not run user code, is that you get fusion of synchronous database I.O. actions. Like all these actions we've seen in the examples are synchronous. They run on JDBC. They're blocking I.O. actions, uh, which means we have to schedule something to run on the database thread, and then it needs to get a connection from the pool and uh, synchronize some state and then run this stuff to return the connection to the pool and set up another memory barrier to write the state back. And there's a bit of overhead involved. And, and also, the, you have to construct a future and sequence, uh, sequence this stuff through a future, which needs extra memory because you have to allocate some objects and free them later. All this can be prevented if we confuse these actions. That's what you do in imperative code. Just run one run action, then run another. And if you have a few database actions, they will automatically be fused. It's only if you use methods like flatmap, which take an execution context, where you don't get this fusion. So we try to make it as efficient as possible, but it's still 100% safe, so that you never run any user code on the database thread pool. OK, so we've looked at immediately materialized results. What about streaming? Let's say we have a query queue which takes some orders, filters them by the ones that have been shipped, and then gets the order ID. We can run this. We can construct, no, we can construct an action. We do not run this at, at, at this point. We construct an action with q.result. That's similar, similar to the old .run method, except now we get an action. And then we can get a future by running it. This is a future of seek of int, if we assume that order ID is an int. Instead, you can also say db.stream and pass this action to it. And then, for example, print the results in a streaming way as they come in from the database. And for this, we use reactive streams. So this is a standard interface for interoperating between different asynchronous streaming APIs. And Slick implements a reactive streams publisher for the database results. Actually, you get a database publisher, which gives you some convenience methods, like for each. But if you want to do anything serious, we don't provide that in Slick out of the box. You need some other platform like Akka Streams. We don't want to duplicate any effort here. Slick just gives you the data, and then you use Akka Streams for further transformation and for combining this data, and eventually passing it to Play, because Play will also support reactive streams. Play 2.4 will add support for it, and Play 3 will make it the default instead of the current iterates. And the nice thing about reactive streams is that it gives you asynchronous streaming with back pressure handling. There are also other asynchronous streaming APIs. There was Java Rx before, for example, derived from Rx on .NET, but it doesn't have back pressure. So what does that mean? Well, if you have asynchronous, if you have synchronous streaming, that is blocking actions, you automatically get back pressure handling. So you never think about this. Here in the center, we have our, our thread, our database handling thread. We make a database call which blocks. Eventually, it returns some data. And then we send that data to the client, which also blocks. And when the client is done processing, we fetch the next piece of data. So this works fine, but of course, it's blocking. And we need a thread all the time. We want to avoid that. So the naive approach to asynchronous streaming looks like this. That's without back pressure handling. We just fetch with our synchronous JDBC call from the database. And whenever we get the data, we send it off to the client. This is a fire and forget action. So we do not get any feedback if the client has already processed this. So if the client cannot keep up with the rate of data we give it, what happens in this case? Who knows? We can't decide. It's only the client who can do something about it. And basically, the two choices the client has is to either buffer all the data or to drop some of it. Both seem kind of stupid because the data comes from a database, right? We have all the data in the database. There's no reason at all to send it to the client at a certain speed. If the client can't, can't keep up, we can send the data later. 
but we need the right interface for that, and that's reactive streams. So here's what we do in the simplest, ca simplest case. The client always requests one single element at a time. So if we start here at the left side, the client initiates the stream and requests the first element. And we immediately go off to the database, fetch the data, and return it to the client. And we always buffer one element ahead. This has the advantage that if we hit a page size border, a page boundary in JDBC, it will automatically fetch the next page from the database. So, so we're reading the next page ahead of time. But we're not sending it to the client yet. At this point, we're done. So our job is suspended, and we can, uh, uh, we can give up the thread. And something else can run on this database thread, because we don't need it for database I.O. anymore. At some later point, the client is ready to receive the next piece of data. And we can immediately send it to the client, because we already have it. And then we go off fetching the next piece of data from the database. And then the client eventually is ready for more, and we go on. And you can see here in the remaining part, if the client is already ready for more data before we're done, we do not give up the thread. We just continue here. We just loop as long as we can, and at some point the client will not be immediately ready, and then we give up the thread. So this is already quite nice, but we can make it, make it more efficient. For example, the client can request two pieces of data at a time. The client can buffer two of them, fine, so it requests two. So you can see these are the points where the client requests, and in between it always gets two responses from us. So we can send it two items from the database before we have to suspend if it cannot keep up. So the, the larger your packet size is, the more efficient it becomes. And in reactive streams, this can be done dynamically by the client. The client decides how much data it wants. So how does the interface for that look like? Well, it's similar to run. We have a stream method. And there's a special streaming type in here. This, this one you only get for collection valued results. So if you get an int from a database, you cannot really stream that. But if you get a seek of int, then instead of materializing the seek, you can stream the individual int values. And this gives you a database publisher of t. This publisher does not do anything until you subscribe to it. And then it will just stream the data out to ACA streams or whatever you use there. So the way these streaming and no stream types are set up, they are, they are covariant both in their element type and also in the type itself. So that means every streaming action can also be used as a no stream, so you can fully materialize it. And all the collection value database results are always streaming. So that's all the information I have for you here, basically. Now it's time for you to try this stuff. We have a nice tool called Activator, which you may have heard of. And we're in the process, process of updating all the tutorials for Slick for the new release, Slick 3.0. The Hello Slick tutorial is already done. That's the first one you should try. And we also have a Slick Plain SQL tutorial that you can try. The other ones will be converted soon in the coming weeks. So just go to typesafe.com slash get dash started and download activator and try this. So what else is new in Slick 3.0? Well, we have the DBIO Action API that I showed you today. And we have improved configuration via TypeSafe config. And we need that because now Slick has out of the box support for Hikari CP as a connection pool. Previously, you had to pass Slick a data source that you got from wherever. But in order to do the right thing for the connection pool and the matching thread pool, we want to configure this together. You can still use your own data source if you want. But the preferred way is that you use Slick's new config syntax. And the main thing you set there, apart from the JDBC connection data, is the uh, thread pool size. That's the main tuning parameter. And then you get a matching connection pool for that.
We also have nested options and properly typed outer joins. Previously you had to write a lot of ugly boilerplate code for an outer join and if you mapped it to a type, to a Scala type on the client side, this was really horrible to write and very error prone. And now you get proper option types for outer joins so this stuff becomes much simpler. Another feature that I've talked to a few individuals uh, of you before and uh, where people always tell me, wow, that's possible, we get type checked plain SQL queries. So there's a new string interpolator for this. We already have the SQL and SQL U interpolators if you want to put your own SQL code instead of uh, using Slick's API and just run that as an action, of course, or stream it. It works the same way, but now you can have a T-SQL interpolator and you annotate this with a, with a Scala annotation to point it to a config file for the database config and then the Scala compiler will connect to the database, validate the code just like, the, validate the SQL code just like it validates your Scala code and infer the return type and pass that back into your Scala code. So that's the major stuff we're bringing to you in the new release. You can see at the bottom RC2 available now. I was optimistic when I put it there a week ago, but it didn't quite make it to this point. So RC1 is out and RC2 coming up soon. The main roadblock ahead is waiting for reactive streams 1.0. They also have an RC out already, so we're getting close. And once reactive streams 1.0 is out and has been finalized, we can release Slick 3.0. So I expect this will be all done in time for Scala Days Amsterdam. So that's all I have. If you want to check it out, go to slick.typesafe.com or follow me on Twitter if you don't do this already. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yes, there's one in the back. So at the moment we're using, okay, the question was uh, about the, the drivers, what dri different drivers are we using for the databases. Uh, we only use JDBC, standard JDBC drivers at the moment for everything. There are non-blocking drivers for Postgres and MySQL. We're taking a look at them and we might support them eventually, perhaps as a commercial add-on to Slick. I do not expect a big performance improvement, but at least shave off some overhead. So, the, so the, the main reason there, there is that we're already quite efficient with the current model and in order to be really, really efficient, you'd need a non-blocking database server. A non-blocking driver will only push the blocking down one further step, so it will shave off some JDBC overhead. That's, that's my expectation and we might eventually support it. Yes? Okay, what about transaction APIs for DB Actions? That's a good question. Um, if you compose DB Actions, you always get another DBIO action out of that. And you can just say dot transactionally and the whole thing will run in a transaction. So there are no nested transactions yet, but it, it does guarantee that everything eventually runs in a transaction. Even if you nest it, it will just use the outermost one for the transaction. You can also set transaction parameters like isolation level. We now have an API for that in Slick 3. And there are a few other parameters you can tune on the connection level and on the request level that were requested before and they have been implemented for Slick 3. You can also write your own actions that reach down directly into JDBC on the connection and do your own logic there if you want. Yes? Uh, not really. So the, the only choice is, okay, is, is there any concept of walking a cursor in there? The only choices you have at the, at the moment is materializing the result completely or getting a reactive stream. What we do for you at the JDBC level is that we only read one element ahead and only after you have synchronously processed the element in a reactive stream.
So if you want to do something like materialize a blob result from a row before you pass the data on for asynchronous processing, you can do that. You can do this directly at the level of the database publisher. You can add synchronous code which runs inside of Slick before it advances the cursor. So you have, you're guaranteed to still be on the same row at this point. But you cannot, for example, go back that we also have support for mutating databases. I never quite liked the API for that, the old one. I don't like the new API either, but we haven't found a better one yet. So this will automatically move the cursor around if you use that. Yes? Okay, so the question is, do you need to learn monads to use this or to teach it? I don't think you really need to learn monads. The fact that I owe is a monad is not, not that important. It helps you to understand it and to understand how to use it if you already know other monads and know what to do with monads. But for the purpose of using the API, it's not really important, no. Okay, no further questions then, thank you.